Now we've come to our final session of what may have seemed to be a very long and concentrated day, but it's been a very remarkable day really, I think, partly because of the remarkable and for all of us unprecedented circumstances in which we're having the conference, but also partly because of the remarkable fact that in these circumstances, we're able to have this conference in the way we have it. And in many ways, this is a kind of summary of the biblical teaching on the image of God. Man is made to be great, really, given great capacities, given tremendous resources in the earth, and indeed commanded to have dominion over the earth. And in some ways, our modern technology is an illustration of the privilege of having dominion over the resources that God has put into the earth in which we live, and yet at the same time, uh, we are uh, a community in our nation and indeed around the world, conscious that our lives are in many ways disintegrating. And here we have these two almost contradictory realities, the greatness of what God gave us the privilege of accomplishing and doing this in the context of a small and invisible virus that most of us don't even begin to understand, that has, in a sense, brought the population of the world to its knees. And it's appropriate, therefore, as we come to the conclusion of our studies on the image of God, that we think about this great Christian conviction, that the image of God recreated in Christians The image of God has a glorious hope for the future, and that this is one of the hallmarks of the Christian in a time of crisis, in a time of hopelessness. Remember how the Apostle Paul speaks in Ephesians chapter 2 about those who are not Christians being without hope in the world. And there's much evidence in the Hellenistic world in which the Apostle Paul lived of the despair and the hopelessness of those who are not Christian believers. So what we're going to think about in this final session is this wonderful biblical truth of the hope of God's image. And I want us to take as a kind of anchor for our thoughts a statement that the Apostle Paul makes in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 49. Very simple but intensely profound statement. Speaking about us as Christian believers, he says, as we have borne the image of the man of dust, we shall bear the image of the man of heaven. And in a sense, that's our entire conference in a nutshell. We were made from the dust of the earth, Genesis 2 verse 7, as we've already heard. But out of the dust of the earth, God created something wonderful. He created man and woman uh, as his own image and gave them dominion. And yet, through our sinfulness, instead of having dominion over the dust of the earth, The Apostle Paul is reflecting the fact that we are dust and we return to dust. We were meant to have dominion over the earth and instead, in a sense, the earth has dominion over us. We die, we disintegrate. And this is true of all men. All men and women die. The exceptions are infrequent in Scripture, aren't they? Enoch walked with God and God took him. Elijah carried to heaven in a chariot of fire. But apart from these exceptions, death passes upon all men because all men sinned in the sin of Adam and sinned in their own sin. But here is the glorious hope of the Christian believer that one day we who bear the image of the man of dust will bear the image of the man from heaven, our Lord Jesus Christ. And this reminds us of the tremendous importance of the theme of being made as the image of God. So 
After all, this in a sense is the bookends of the whole story of the Bible, from Genesis 1 and 2 to the end of the book of Revelation, when the whole story is completed, that we are made as the image of God, that that image has disintegrated in our lives, but that through the gospel that image will be restored in us, to us, and then will appear finally in all its glory. In my own view, this doctrine of the image of God has been one of the most neglected doctrines in the last hundred years of the Christian church and in the evangelical church. And in many ways, it is an explanation of our current political and uh, social climate. If you think about the disintegration, the moral disintegration that has been in the Western world over the last 25 to 50 years, and people have often said to me, I'm sure they've said this to you, I can't believe how rapidly this has happened. Uh, the fact that now you have to choose your identity, you have got to invent your identity if you're a young person, you're given a, a whole variety of possibilities, but you've got to invent who you are. And we no longer know what it means to be me. We no longer know who we are. We no longer know what it means to be a man or a woman. And it all seems to have happened so rapidly. But you know, if you think about it, it's happened very logically. Because when a society removes God from the situation, it inevitably removes the truth about man from the situation. Because when we remove God, we take away our identity, the image of God. And sadly, we no longer know who we are. And the consequences of that, the detritus of that, it washes up upon the shores of our Western societies. But then comes the gospel into this confusion and teaches us the great truth that in Jesus Christ this image may be restored. When I was a boy at school in my last year in high school, one of my teachers gave me a very fine copy of Dietrich Bonhoeffer's book, The Cost of Discipleship. And it was a very fine copy because it included more than that one work. And I was intrigued as a 17-year-old by a poem that Bonhoeffer had written in prison entitled, Who Am I? And it was a Christian reflection on, it was a Christian form of self-examination. I hear how people speak of me as a real Christian. But am I really that person that they are describing? I know in my own heart, I'm, I'm not what I long to be myself. And I know I'm not altogether what they think I am. But the poem, Who Am I?, was a Christian reflecting on personal integrity in the Christian life. I remember hearing uh, some time ago that uh, among the poems that youngsters were writing, teenagers in our present time, the single most frequent title was Bonhoeffer's title, Who Am I? But these poems were not poems of reflection on what I'm called to be through the Christian gospel. These poems were poetry of despair. Who am I? Because I no longer know. And this is why, you know, if you're a Christian, uh, if you're just a very young Christian, I mean young in years as well as young in Christian faith, God has given you a truth in the gospel that enables you to know who you really are. You know who you are, you know where you came from, you know what you're for, you know what your destiny is. You have this glorious hope of the gospel, and that in and of itself, that glorious hope of the gospel, makes your life stand out. People may have a distaste for the integrity it produces, for the peace it produces. They may be inwardly 
angry, although they will be outwardly critical of you, but inwardly jealous, because they are hopeless, as the Apostle Paul says. They have no reason for hope. They have no logical reason for hope. And by contrast, as a Christian believer, you have every reason Scripture gives you to live in the hope, that is, in the calm and quiet assurance that you will one day fully experience what has been promised to you in the gospel, that one day you will bear the image of the man who has come from heaven in its most glorious form. Now, I think we can think about the whole story of the Bible this way. Created as the image of God, and then, if I can put it this way, that image stolen from us by the serpent, by the evil one. And then our Lord Jesus Christ, who is himself as God's Son, the image of God, coming in order to restore us to that image. And finally, as it were, as Paul says in Philippians chapter 1, putting the finishing touches to that work by transforming us fully into the likeness of the Lord Jesus Christ. Maybe I can help explain this in the form of a, a pretty obvious parable. The language of image and likeness that's used in Genesis 1, 26 to 28, reappears, you remember, in Genesis 5, verses 1 to 3. God made man as his image and likeness, and then what happens? Then, if you look at what God says there about what happens, it's this. Adam lived 130 years and fathered a son in his own likeness after his image. Now, what's, what's Moses telling us there? He's giving us a little hint that image, being the image of God, is family language. Family language. You see the connection there? God made us as his image and likeness, and Adam has a son in his image and likeness. The atmosphere is the family, that the son bears the image of the father, and that you can see this written into the warp and woof of Genesis 1 and 2. What God did in creation was, as a gracious father, to create a son in his likeness. One might even say to create a son, a, a terrestrial son, a miniature son in the likeness of his own eternal son. And the story is this. Um, imagine, a, imagine a father who loves his son and so loves his son, he, he hires the greatest portrait painter in the world to paint a portrait of his son. And suddenly one night, he hears a sound in the house, the alarm bells are ringing, he puts on the lights, and he sees a man running out of his house with the great portrait under his arm. And he is he is desolate. He calls the police. The police come. They take fingerprints. The CSI people come. They do all the things that they do on television. And then three weeks later, a policeman turns up at his house with a great smile on his face and says, Sir, we have caught the thief. Now, this father believes in justice, just like you believe in justice. Good they caught the thief. But you're not so interested in the issue of whether they caught the thief. What do you say to the policeman if you're the father? You say, did you get my portrait back? And in a way, that's a parable of the gospel, isn't it? God, of course, is wholly committed to justice, to judging sin, to overcoming the serpent, Satan, who has been engaged in the theft of God's image that he, he just did not have a, a portrait painted. He himself created a living portrait. And perhaps we can think about this, that the whole story of the Bible is the way in which God gives expression to the fact that he wants his portrait back. 
He wants the portrait of his son that he painted, the living portraits of his son that he painted. He wants that portrait back. And the whole story of the Bible is how he prepared the way for that to happen and how it did happen. How did it happen? You know the story well. But the story has tremendous significance in this context, isn't it? That the way in which he restored the portrait was by sending the original by sending the original in such a way that the original himself would be defaced. Remember the language that Isaiah uses in Isaiah 52, just as he's coming up to speak about the suffering servant. He says that he would be marred beyond human likeness. Do you know one of the commentators says the nuance of that is that men would not just say he is badly marred. He would be so badly marred they would say, can he really be human? Marred beyond human likeness. It's Isaiah's prophecy of what would happen to the Lord Jesus, how he would take our shame by bearing our sin, and then in crushing the head of the thief, he would himself be crushed. But then in the resurrection, this was the great plan of God, in the resurrection, the Son of God who was marred would be perfected in our place, in our humanity, as the, as the very first restored man in the power of the resurrection, in a body that the Apostle Paul calls a glorious body, that body that was able to do amazing, glorious things, even, even as he didn't want to totally take the apostles and his friends by complete shock, even in the way he was able to appear and disappear, the marvelous presence of the risen Christ. And as the apostles understood this, they realized what God was doing, that now through the Holy Spirit, he was opening our eyes to see what the image of God was really like. Remember how Paul puts it in 2 Corinthians 4 verse 6? He says, our eyes have been opened to see the light of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. And he says that riding on the back of what he had earlier said, that those who have seen the image restored, indeed glorified in Jesus Christ, as they gaze upon him, as they trust in him, as they come to know him, as they come to love him, they themselves are being transformed into his likeness, into his image from one degree of glory to another, so that we know who we are. We are those who have been recreated in the image of God after the likeness of the Lord Jesus Christ in our humanity. And we know what's happening in our lives in good days and bad days, in times of joy, times of sorrow, under pressure, in affliction, facing suffering, we know that he is transforming us more and more into his likeness from one degree of glory to another. And this is the reason we can be sure the hope of the future will never let us down because it's already begun. And this is what Paul means when he says, we bore the image of the man made from the dust and we're going to fully bear the image of the man who came from heaven to restore that image to us. And in this context, in 1 Corinthians 15, the Apostle Paul teaches us, I think, two very important lessons. First of all, he spells out what will happen in the future in God accomplishing this great plan and then he also spells out what the implications of that hope are for us. So, 
If you will, let me just take a minute or two to open up these two things. How will this take place? And what are the present implications for us of the fact that it will take place? Now, the interesting thing in 1 Corinthians 15 is that Paul has set all he's saying about we bear the image of the man of dust, we're going to bear the image of the man from heaven. He, he puts that within a very interesting framework. And you'll find that framework earlier on in the chapter from about verse 22 following. Verse 22 is a direct parallel to verse 49. In verse 22, he says, as in Adam all die, so in Christ they'll be made alive. We bore the image of the man of dust, we're going to bear the image of the man from heaven. But now his interest is in this question, how is that going to happen? And in the verses that follow, quite complicated really. If you, if you look at these verses and think about them, you will notice that he uses an expression here. Verse 23, as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. That's the big picture, but each in his own order. He's saying God is going to do this according to his own order. Now, let me untangle that order. It, it won't take a minute, but it's very thrilling to be able to do it. He says, first of all, God began to do this in the day of Christ's own resurrection, verses 22 to 23a. As in Adam all die, so in Christ shall all be made alive, but each in his own order, Christ the first fruits, Christ the first fruits, Christ the first fruits who guarantees the final harvest, Christ the guarantee that what has happened to him will happen to all those who belong to him. So the order is this, first of all, Christ is raised from the dead. So there is the day of Christ's resurrection. But now he fast forwards to the future in verse 23, and he speaks about the day of our resurrection. As in Christ, all will be raised from the dead who belong to Christ. Christ the firstfruits, and then when he comes, those who belong to him. But then he says, on that day, that day of our resurrection, will also be a great day of destruction. Because notice he says in verses 24 and 25, that at that time he will reign, I'm thinking especially of verse 25, until he has put all of his enemies under his feet. And that day of destruction will also be the day of final victory. Notice then he says in verse 26, and there is a last enemy who will be destroyed, the enemy of death. So there has been the day of Christ's resurrection, and it guarantees this day that is still to come, the day of our resurrection, that will be the day of the destruction of our enemies, that will be the day of Christ's victory over our last enemy. And then he says in verse 28, which simply expounds verse 24, at the end, he will deliver the kingdom to God the Father once he has done all this. And verse 28, when all things are subjected to him, then, just try and take this in, then the Son himself will also be subjected to him who put all things in subjection under him that God may be all in all. Now, let me give you the picture first before I explain it. The picture is that the Son has come from heaven. He has taken our place. And now He's going to exercise dominion over all things where we failed. And He has not only exercised dominion by expanding the Garden of Eden, He has exercised dominion by overcoming the serpent, by dealing with the weeds, by destroying all of His enemies and ours, by abolishing death, 
by, as it were, fulfilling the dominion command that God gave to the first Adam. The second man, the last Adam, has fulfilled it in our place. And now he's coming with all that. Picture him coming with all that on this great day when he gathers his people together. He's coming with all that. He's coming with all of his enemies under his feet. He's coming as the one who transforms all things and makes them new. And we're with him. We're behind him. We're beside him. We're watching him. What's he going to do? And Paul says he's going to go to the Father and he's going to say, it's for you. You gave it to us and it was lost. But now I've regained it. And all of these, they are my joint heirs. And now we're coming to you. And we want to give this back to you as our present of faith, as our present of love. And then can you see the whole of the church of Jesus Christ in every age gathered with Jesus Christ and, as it were, with one instinct as we keep our eyes on Jesus. He bows down before the Heavenly Father in a gracious submission to Him. And so we, like Him, bow down, and with Him we say to the Father, you are all in all. Now, you see, everything Paul has said in this passage helps us to understand this amazing hope that we will be there on that day. Paul is not saying that the eternal divine Son will then become subordinate to the eternal divine Father. What he's saying is that the Son who came into our flesh as the second man and the last Adam will, as our representative and leader, lead us all to the throne of God in the grand recovery of everything that we had lost and say to Him, we bring it to you because our desire, which Adam failed to fulfill, is that you should be all in all in our lives and in all things. It's not that the eternal Son is subordinating Himself to the eternal Father. That would be a total misunderstanding. But it is to say our dear Savior who has come into our flesh, who has borne the image of God in our flesh so perfectly and yet been marred and in God's grace and justice restored in order that He might restore that image to us, will one day on our behalf complete the work which He came from heaven to do and lead us all to that place where with one voice we will say that God is all in all and that God is all in all to us. And Paul is saying it's already begun. He's already begun to transform us so that we long for that day. And you see what the implication of this is? We've only a couple of minutes. Let me just point out two of the implications. The first is what he goes on to say in verses 30 to 32. He's saying this is the reason we are able to be in danger every day. This is why we're willing to die daily. This is why I fought with beasts at Ephesus. This hope puts muscle into my life. It gives me courage in the face of danger and threat and difficulty. Even the threat upon my own existence. These light afflictions, says Paul, they seem light by comparison with the hope of glory. And then if you fast forward to the conclusion he draws when he's fully expounded all this right at the end of the chapter, and he says to us, therefore, my beloved brothers, in verse 58, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, because you have this hope, and therefore you know that as you live for eternity, 
none of your labor will be in vain. What a hope to be filled with. And this is the hope the gospel gives to us today. May the God of hope fill you, therefore, with peace and joy in believing. Let's pray together. Our great God, we thank you for the privilege you've given us of sitting under the ministry of your word throughout this day, and by these technological means sensing that we belong to a great company of your people throughout the earth, to whom you have given the hope of the gospel, who have begun to be refashioned after your likeness and in your image. And we pray in these difficult days these days of stress which your word promises will come in the last days. We pray that something of the dignity and poise and peace and joy of the hope of the gospel will shine forth from our lives, that we who have been recreated after the likeness of your Son, who know who we are, who know what you are doing in our lives, through every circumstance, every providence, who have this glorious assurance of what awaits us, that our very lives may point this lost and dying world and those we know in it to faith in Jesus Christ, to this glorious transformation of life, and to this steadfast and sure hope of the gospel. We pray that this will be so. Keep us in prayer. Keep us in the hollow of your hand. Help us to live in peace and joy and hope. For the glory of our great Savior, we pray. Amen.